All right. Real interesting story here in Judges chapter number 17. We're going to go through this a little bit, kind of like a Bible study, but there's actually going to be a greater um, point that I'm going to be making behind this. And <laughs> it's important to kind of read stories carefully. It, al it always is. Read your Bible carefully. But the more carefully you kind of read this story, the more, I don't know, for at least me at least, it gets a little bit more funny. And when you start thinking about this stuff, just starting off at the beginning. So what happens here at the beginning of the story is this woman has a son and the son steals money from her. And basically he fesses up and just like, oh yeah, you know what, that money you've been looking for, mom, like I took it. And then she's like, oh, she, it, she's, this is what she says. She says, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Now, I don't know about you, and I know my children are kind of younger, and this is, this is he's obviously an older man, like at least, you know, I mean, at the very least, he's got to be like in his teens or something. A, he's old enough to be having all these graven images and stuff and into all this stuff. But first of all, let's just start with the, what a shekel even is. Because it's easy to read that and just be like, well, I have no, no concept. What is that? What does that even mean? Just to put it in some type of relative terms, just for us to understand today, um, even just to get a ballpark, right? Because the exact doesn't really matter for what we're dealing with today. A shekel is just a weight. It's a weight unit of measure. And when people would weigh money, that's how they would do it, weigh money. You know, it was, um, a shekel would be a, just a certain weight. And, and in today's um, metrics, a shekel is approximately half an ounce, at least according to the websites where I looked it up at. Okay, that's, it's not something that, you know, it, it may be a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, doesn't matter, right? It's going to be roughly about a half an ounce. Well, these are shekels of silver that he had. So a half an ounce, one ounce of silver today, as of like last night, price is around $16.50, a spot price for silver, Okay. So let's just say one shekel is about eight bucks because it's half an ounce. Just, just pretty easy math, right? Eight bucks for a shekel. This guy stole over a thousand shekels. That's over $8,000 that he stole from his own mother. I don't know about you, but if my kid stole eight grand from me and then is like, oh, well, you know all that money you've been looking for? I actually took it. I'm not going to be like, oh, blessed be thou of the Lord. Right? I'm going to be pretty angry with my child for doing that. Now, obviously, they ought to fess up, but I'm not going to just bless them for stealing my money and giving it back. You know, it's not, that is not something that deserves a blessing. But this whole household is screwed up. And it starts with their religion. And that's why they're, they're all screwed up to begin with. But one of the things you'll notice, too, is that they've got to be relatively wealthy. Because this family, he's got this, you know, he steals over $8,000 from his mom. And then what she said, she's like, oh, no, no, here. She gives it back to him. The money that he stole, and he's like, no, you know what, mom, I took it. She's like, no, you know what? She said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son. She's like, I was already dedicating that money to God for you. And she said, to make a graven image and a molten image now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. So she's like, I'm just going to give it back to you because I was already putting that money aside for you to make this graven image unto the Lord. Now, right away, you should have red flags going off. They say, you see people throwing the name of the Lord around? I mean, this is the God of the Bible, the Lord, and they're making graven images? Like, what in the world? This is after, by, mind you, Judges comes after the books of Moses. They have the law from Moses and it hasn't been that long. And very clearly, you get the Ten Commandments graven in stone. They would have still had those tablets graven in stone to like literally be able to see. The, the first two commandments, you know, not to have any gods before me and not to make yourself any graven image of anything. But is that really that hard to, to understand? No, of course not. We have people today that throw the name of Christ around. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, we're Christian. Oh, you know, but are they really? No. 
Are they really believing in God? Do they really care about God, what God's word says? No. It's the same situation that we have here. Now, the title of my sermon this evening is A Form of Godliness. A Form of Godliness. Because these people have a form of godliness, right? There's some shape or form of godliness. They're, they're, they're trying to worship God in some way. It's in their own way. So they have a form of godliness, but they deny it the power thereof. There is no power in their belief. There's no power in their God. There's no power in their idol. Just like so many so-called Christians today have no power in their faith because it's vain, because it's dead, because it's after the traditions of this world, because it's in idols, because it's in anything other than the God of the Bible. So she says, oh no, I dedicate it. And the reason why I say it, they probably relatively wealthy because who's even going to say, yeah, I put $8,000 aside just to, to build some graven image for the Lord. But one other thing that comes out in this story is just their hypocrisy anyways. It's, it's all just this fluff. It's all just talk. It's all just vanity. See, they talk the big game. They'll talk the big spiritual talk. Oh, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. You brought my money back. Oh, I was going to make this graven image for the Lord and just for you. <coughs> Look at verse number four, though. It says, yet he restored the money unto his mother. So he's just like, no, 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 mom, here. I'm just giving it back to you, right? And his mother took 200 shekels of silver. Now, didn't she just say the 1,100 shekels of silver she had dedicated for the Lord, for him to have this graven image? But what does she do when she gets it back? She only takes out 200 of that money and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. She wasn't putting 1,100 shekels aside for him for a graven image. She took a, a fraction of that. And, oh, okay, yeah, now that's dedicated to the Lord, right? It shows their hypocrisy and it shows they're just the spiritual talk and this language that they're using. And it's all just vanity. Now, Jump down to verse number 10 because I'd, I already covered this, you know, what a shekel is worth, which is roughly 8,000 bucks that this guy stole from his mom. But obviously, you know, money changes a little bit, just, just the value over time. But in the Bible, there's, there's multiple things that we could find as far as just what shekels are worth. I have a few examples for you. Genesis 23, 15, this is when Abraham was, was looking for a burying place. So he's looking to buy property and he was buying a cave for his wife for, for Sarah to be buried in. And, it's, and Genesis 23, 15 says, My Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? So a, a, a chunk of land to buy like, you know, a, plot, a nice piece of land to have a burial place and everything like that is worth 400 shekels. That's probably matching up with what we're seeing here. You know, I mean, half, roughly half of that amount, for, you know, a few hundred bucks. I mean, a few thousand bucks to buy a piece of property, right? Nothing on it, just, just a bare piece of property. Or in Numbers uh, 7, there's all these offerings that they were given. And just gives you how much, like it says, a silver charger, the weight thereof was 130 shekels. Just to get an idea of what the weight is. So a charger is like a bowl or a pitcher, you know, like these, these instruments of service. It says one silver bowl of 70 shekels, right? So it's kind of giving you the weight. You kind of think, oh, okay, well, bowls, roughly what the size of it would be in that weight. But in Judges 17.10, we see Micah, he ends up finding this Levite, right? So he's got these molten images. He already has a house of, of graven images, molten images, these, this idolatry. And then he runs across this Levite. So they have this form of the right religion. They have the Bible. They have the words of Moses. But they're already just taking it and twisting it into whatever they want to do. Obviously, he didn't like commandment number two, so he just ignores it. But now he's thinking, because he's real superstitious, he likes these objects, he likes this idolatry. Now he's like, ooh, a Levite, I'm going to get one of these guys to me too. I was going to add that to my collection because now I'm going to be really in good standing with God because I have these idols, I've got a Levite, he's going to be my priest, he's going to be my father, right? He's going to direct me and we're going to be good. And it says in Judges 17, 10, And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee... 10 shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. 
Now, the reason why I want to point this out is, again, what, what is, the, va what is the, the real value of the truth or of God in this guy's life? He, he's, he seems to be very big on the exterior. We already see that he's a thief. He stole money from his mom. Yeah, he gave it back, but he stole $8,000 from his mom. I mean, what type of person does that even, even if you return it? Just to begin with, to steal eight grand. And now, you know, there's all that money, 1,100 shekels of silver. But you know what he's willing to do? Pay this guy 10 shekels a year. 10 shekels a year. That's 80 bucks a year. To have this priest and father unto me. Now, granted, he's giving him clothing and he's giving him food. Right? So that's included in, in the price. So he doesn't have to pay it. But still, 80 bucks a year it really shows how serious you are about serving the Lord, right? But it's not about being genuine. It's not about seeking the truth. It's just about having these things. It's, it's, like, it's almost just like this superstition. What can I get away with? What's the, the, the best way I could look outwardly religious or spiritual. And to him, it was having this Levite, having this priest. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says that Micah consecrated the Levite and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. What's he trusting in that God's going to do good to him? Just the fact that he has a Levite. He has a form of godliness. He's not claiming to be an atheist. He's believing in the Lord, right? He would say that, oh yeah, I believe in the Lord. But does he really? He doesn't even understand. Apparent, it seems apparent that he's very ignorant of who the Lord is. Because if you think that some Levite, some priest is going to save you, you've got another thing coming. Now we also see you know, a little bit about this priest, too. He didn't seem to treat his job very carefully at all. Now, because a Levite was supposed to work for the Lord, right? He was supposed to work in the tabernacle. He was supposed to work in the service of the Lord. And that was their job, and they didn't have inheritance. You know, he's supposed to do that. But he just goes in under this guy's house and just be like, okay, I'll just be your personal priest. Was that what the Levite was supposed to do? No. They're supposed to be serving in the tabernacle. They're supposed to be, you know, offering up the sacrifices and doing that type of stuff, not just, just being hired by some individual and just being his personal at-home priest, you know, to give him communion or whatever. And, you know, as I read through this too, as I, read, I don't know about you, but this just like stinks of Catholicism. It's just like, well, that's what, there's so many things about this. It's just like, that's exactly like the Catholic Church. They've got, I'm going to have this priest. He's going to be a father to me. And what's the Catholic Church do? They have priests that are called fathers. They have all kinds of idolatry. They have graven images all throughout their places of worship. It's exactly what Micah has. <coughs> now, in the next chapter, what happens is people from the tribe of Dan, they're, they're still going to like conquer all of their inheritance in the land of Israel. So they, they haven't completely established all of their boundaries, all of their territory yet. So there's this, this group from Dan comes in. There's, first, there's five soldiers that are kind of sent out to spy out the land. And one of them recognizes the voice of the priest, the Levite. So they turn into Micah's house and they talk to him like, hey, man, what are you doing here? You know, and he's like, oh, you know, I'm serving Micah here, whatever. He gives him the story. And then they come back. The after the five soldiers come back with all the troops because they found a place where they're like, Hey, these people are living carelessly. You know, they don't have any walls. It's going to be easy. No one's there to help protect them or defend them. We're going to be able to just take this place over and just, and just conquer it and be done. And um, so on their way, they pass by Micah's house. And these 600 soldiers, then they steal the graven images and they take the priest to themselves. So again, it's another type of vain people they're about to go to war, so they want the good luck charms that Micah had. Because that's all they are to him, right? He's got these idols, he's got this collection, he's got this priest. All it is is a bunch of good luck charms. It's just a bunch of vanity. It's just a bunch of superstition. 
Well, these guys, now they're going to battle and they would just want to take all this stuff with them because they think it's going to help them. And this is the mindset of people who are stuck in a vain religion. I mean, think of rosary beads, right? You get in a, in a, in a bad situation, oh, I got to have my beads. Think of, I mean, anything like that. People have all kinds of little trinkets and knickknacks and holy water or whatever, you know, some, some special blessed thing, a Bible, what, like, like some, something that they just think, oh, this in and of itself has some extra spiritual power. Or their, you know, their crosses, their crucifixes, whatever it is that they want to, you know, rub and hold on to and chant their prayers with or whatever. It's a vain religion. It's vanity. It is a form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. Look at Judges chapter 18. We're going to start reading in verse number 17. You're going to read about these, these men that then go in and steal all of Micah's stuff. Verse number 17. And the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priests stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with weapons of war. And these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. Then said the priest unto them, what do ye? Now look, isn't it interesting how you reap what you sow too? That guy stole eight grand from his mom. Now what happens? All these people just walk, just barge right into his house and just steal all his stuff. Now, it's not right to steal. And I'm not saying that these guys did right, but what I'm saying is that guy's ended up reaping what he sowed. He was a thief. He's getting stuff stolen from him again. So then the priest is just like, whoa, what are you guys doing, you know? And they said unto him, hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth and go with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man? Or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel. And the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people. This Levite doesn't care. He has no integrity for God's word at all. First of all, he had no problem getting hired by one man to be a priest with all this idolatry and just be okay with it. Oh, yeah, okay, I'll be your priest. Yeah, we have all these idols over here. Then these other people come along and start stealing his stuff, and they're like, hey, you know, come with us. Isn't it better to be, instead of just being with this one guy, you could be a father to us, this whole group of people. He's like, yeah, that actually sounds pretty good. All right. And then he takes, the, he's like, he's like, helps him steal. He's like, okay, I'll take the ephod. Let's go. Well, I'll be a priest unto you now. He doesn't care. He has no loyalty to his son, right? Isn't he supposed to be a father to Micah? He cares about nothing but himself. Turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 3. No problem with the idolatry. No integrity. No care for God's word. Just cares about himself. Well, 2 Timothy chapter 3 warns us about people like this. It's something we have to keep our eye on. The Bible says in verse number 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Doesn't that sound like the Levite? He didn't care about anyone but himself. He really didn't care about that guy he was supposed to be serving. He cared about getting paid and living probably just a pretty easy life. Didn't care about what the Lord thought. Didn't care about rebuking him for the idolatry. Didn't care about the guys coming in and stealing someone he's supposed to be, you know, working for. Lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Obviously, this whole list is just breaking down a reprobate. It is just telling, just describing, just like Romans 1 does, all these different attributes of a reprobate or a false prophet. And then verse number 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. There are people out there that are trying to deceive. There's wicked people that they will have a form of godliness. 
They'll invoke the name of Christ. They'll invoke the Lord. They'll say that they worship God, but they don't. They're denying the power thereof. They don't really care about the truth. They just care about their rituals. They care about their traditions, and they just care about their trinkets and, and, and so on. Back in Judges 18, you don't have to turn if you want to. Turn if you would to 1 Samuel chapter 4. I'm just going to finish up that story in Judges 18. Because Micah comes back. And he finds out like all this stuff is gone. Right? He's like, his idols are gone. His priest is gone. So he catches up with them. And he's upset. And they're just like, you know, what do you want? And uh, Judges 18, 24 says, and he said, you have taken away my gods, which I made. You know, it's like, I thought it was to the Lord. Now he's calling them my gods. Vain religion. You've taken away my gods, which I made, and the priest, and ye are gone away, and what have I more? And what is this that you say unto me, what aileth thee? They're like, what do, you, what do you mean, what's wrong with me? You stole all my stuff. Of course there's something wrong with me. And then, of course, they threaten him. And just when he sees that he's outnumbered and there's nothing he can do about it, he just has to go home and just, just take the loss. But then at the end of the chapter, in verses 30 and 31, the Bible says, and the children of Dan set up the graven image. So mind you, this all started with Micah in Micah's house. He had his own personal stash, his own set of graven images in his house. So you could say, who did his sin really affect? Oh, well, it, pretty, it just affected Micah. You know, yeah, Micah, his mother, yeah, they were screwed up. But him having that all set up in his house, now other people found out about it. They stole it. Now look what happens. It says, and the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. That's some pretty long-lasting effects of that sin. That idolatry. And, and, you know, when you see things like this, is it any wonder that God said, don't even make it? Don't even talk about the false gods. Don't even, don't even bring it up. Something that one person does. And, and, I mean, you could still think, and I still think, how ridiculous is it to <clears throat> have one person just imagine some God, just create some molten image, just, just take metal and form it and shape it to look like a creature, or to look like whatever, and for other people to worship it as a god. That's ridiculous. Yet people do it today. Maybe not as much with the physical metal, but people make up their own gods all the time because they can make them whatever they want them to be. That's the draw of idolatry. That is why people would, would choose to worship some little image. Why? Because it can't speak. It can't talk. It can't give you any feedback or any information because it's dumb. It's an inanimate object. So you can just choose to exalt it and then just give it whatever attributes you want. You say, oh, I'm going to be nice to my God and my God will be nice to me and you can feel good about yourself and anything that you've ever done wrong because you're God, you make up the rules on how your God acts. And that's what idolatry is and people, do, like I said, people do all the time. You could call it the Lord, but it's not the Lord. You can say you're a Christian, but when you're not listening and believing what this book says, you're not a Christian. You call it whatever you want. You've made up your own God. A long time ago, quite a while ago, at my previous place of employment, I, I tried giving the gospel to my boss. And, um, you know, I was just, he's a really nice guy, gave me a good opportunity to, to talk to him. And, um, you know, we talked about a lot of things, and this time I was able to, to try to preach the gospel to him. And as we were talking, I, you know, he, he's, he was Catholic, but not really. 
like most Catholics. He's not really Catholic. I mean, it's just Catholic because that's the way he was raised. And, you know, maybe once or twice a year go to church or whatever. And if someone gets married, he'll be in a Catholic church. Or if someone gets baptized as a Catholic church, whatever, right? Just like your typical Catholic. But in the course of conversation, you know, I'm telling him what the Bible says. And he was saying that, you know, he didn't, didn't believe that or didn't agree with that. And I was like, well... You say, you say you believe, you know, you're Catholic or whatever, but you don't believe this, you don't believe that, you don't believe that. It's like you just made up your own God then. And the reason why I bring up the story is what was kind of amazing is he thought about it for a second. He's a really intelligent guy. And he said, yeah, I guess you're right. Didn't even phase him. Didn't even matter. He recognized. Yeah, I guess I did make up my own God. Eh, it's sad, but people do it. And we need to be aware of that because I'll tell you what, it's a lust of the flesh. Pride, idolatry, it's, it's something that, that can, you can fall into, especially when you, you have other sins. You know, idolatry is one that's going to be easy to get into because if you want to make excuses for your sin, it's easy to start twisting who God really is and just start coming up with your own God even though the Bible's crystal clear on our instructions on what's a sin and what's not a sin, when you start going off into your own sin, you don't want to have to face the truth. It's very easy to start changing things about who God is and just come up with your own version of God. People who don't want to change and live a godly life, you know what? Their, their God's going to all of a sudden just be this just really... Just super, like everything's fine. Hey, we're not under the law, man. We're free. We're free in Christ, bro. <coughs> Those are the people you're going to run into because they don't really care about what God's word says. They don't care about the commandments. They don't care about the laws. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And how is it they deny the power of? Because true godliness, there is power to that. God's word always comes with power. Look at how God's word has been delivered all throughout scripture. Is there not power when God delivers his word? Look at when Moses came out of Egypt. There was power there. When Joshua led the children of Israel in the promised land, there was power there. When David was ruling and reigning as king over Israel, there was power there. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, obviously there was power there. When the disciples went out and were soul winning and preaching the word of God, there was power there. The Apostle Paul himself says, you know, the, when people were criticizing the Apostle Paul and they're saying, oh yeah, he's real weighty in his letters, but when he comes here, it's going to be a different story. He's saying, you want to see what it's going to be like when I come there? Should I come with a rod or should I come in love? So you choose because they were known by their power. Because they're preaching the word of God. The Bible says that, that, the, that God's not given us the spirit of, of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. With the truth, with God's word, there is power. That is the right religion. When you, when you actually worship the Lord and you're serving righteousness, there is power in that. But people who just have their own gods, their own idols that they made up, yeah, there's some semblance or some form of godliness, but they completely deny the power thereof. There is no power behind it because it's a lie. So we see that the children of Dan, they set up that graven image that Micah had made and they started worshiping that as their god. And then they made their own priests they weren't even Levites anymore. Like they had that one Levite and then it's just, oh, well, the children of dead, they just, they took um, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, instead of the household of Joseph to be their priest. They just made up their own priests. Well, they're going to be our priests. We know that the Lord made the Levites the priests, but we're just going to make the children of Joseph priests. Just because, I mean, why not? You're making up your own gods anyways. You might as well make your own priests. And it said that that lasted until the day of the captivity. Judges, this is like 
This is before any kings. The captivity happens at the end of the books of the kings. That's a long time to be steeped in this false religion. This false religion lasted hundreds and hundreds of years, and it started with one man, literally. One man and his graven image. And all of a sudden, you have this whole religion. A whole group of people that just followed this, and then it just became tradition. Year after year after year after year. Kind of like the Catholic Church. It's tradition. It's based totally off of tradition. Why are so many people Catholic? Because that's how they're born. Because that's how they're raised. Because that's how their culture is. Not because they actually believe what they're being taught. Not because there's any integrity there. Not because they care about what the Bible says. But because it's just tradition. Because they get to make up their own God. They like having a form of godliness. It makes them feel good. But completely deny the power thereof. There is no saving in that religion. The children of Israel also had their own form of godliness when it came to the Ark of the Covenant. You're in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Look at verse number 2. And if you're familiar with 1 Samuel, remember that the first few chapters start off, of course, with Samuel even coming into the house of Eli and him being dedicated to the Lord. And then we hear about Eli and his sons. And now his sons were actually sons of Belial. They were reprobates. They were wicked men. Serving in the house of the Lord. And as a result of their wickedness and of Eli's lack of, you know, of choosing his children basically over God, God had to, to, to decide, you know, he decided to take away basically the priesthood from the house of Eli. Like the, the, the house of Eli was just going to be completely wiped out as a result of his sin. And he was going to, you know, then use Samuel, which, of course, he does. But um, in this story here in 1 Samuel chapter 4, the children of Israel are at odds with the Philistines, right? The Philistines are kind of battling with, with the children of Israel. And um, because of the, the sins of Eli and his sons, especially because of his sons, and they're just, just not caring for, for the Lord, the power of God had left from the children of Israel, departed from them. Why? Because when you are not committed to God and, and just serving him, his power is going to leave you. When you start serving other gods, when you start allowing these reprobates to just run the whole show, well, guess what? God's power isn't going to be with you. Verse number two in First Samuel chapter four, look at the Bible reads here. It says, and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. Israel suffers a defeat at the hands of the Philistines. Verse number three. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So they say, why did we lose? Why, why didn't God beat these people for us? I know. Let's go get the ark. And they're treating the ark as this, you know, rabbit's foot. It's their lucky charm. It's their horseshoe. It's the, oh, I know why God's not fighting for us, because we just need to bring this object over here, and now God's just going to be with us. This is the form of godliness that so many people have. It's just some artifact. It's just some thing. It's some cross that's missing that I need. And once I have that, oh man, the power of God's going to be with me. No, it's not. This is their form of godliness. Let's keep reading. Because notice it said, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies in verse 3. It. What? The ark. Not God, but this thing. It's similar to saying, you know, we go out soul winning, that this thing is going to get someone saved. Just the pages and the binding and like, like this thing. Like, let's just, like, I just need to have this thing. Here, here, touch this. Go, put it on your head. Okay, are you saved? Did you feel anything? It's the same type of vanity. No, 
the words. This is what they need, right? They need the word of God. This contains the words. The Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments. It contained the word of God. The power came from God's word. The power came from the Lord, not the inanimate object. It's never been about the object. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four. So the people went to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, who <coughs> were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang. So everyone in Israel gets excited like, yeah, the Ark of the Lord's here. Now we're going to win. You know, they get motivated. And it's loud. I mean, the excitement is big. This really gives them a confidence booster, right? Because they're all super superstitious in this thing. And it actually scares the Philistines because they hear all the excitement and going, whoa, whoa. You know why? Because the Philistines are superstitious too. They think that they have this magical power in this box because they've heard these stories about Moses Oh no, they brought, they brought that box. Now what are we going to do? It's like their secret weapon. <coughs> Which actually reduces the glory of the Lord and the Lord's power into some object. It's not some magic amulet. We're talking about the power of God here, but they don't understand it at all, which is why there's no power to it. So verse number six, and when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. And the Philistines were afraid for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Now, what's kind of funny about this or even ironic is that they're actually giving even more recognition to God than the children of Israel did. They were just happy about the ark being there, but they're not saying, now God's with us. They just had this, this thing. They're saying, oh, these mighty gods, which obviously they don't understand there's one God. They, you know, they're, there's polytheistic saying, oh, there's, they have all these mighty gods that did these things. But they're worried about the gods the power coming from the gods, not just that object. Verse number nine, though, it says, Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for their fellow of Israel, 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Why? Because the power of God wasn't there. It wasn't in the ark. The power of God is with God and, and with his people when they're going to listen to him, when they're going to hearken to him, when they're going to obey him. Then you're going to have the power of God. You want the power of God in your life? Do what's right. Listen to his words and try to live out a life the way that God tells you to live. Then, you're, then you'll have the power. Then you have nothing to worry. If God be for us, who could be against us? Yeah, but God has to be for you. God's not for the people that are rejecting him and worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator. You start making up your own gods, God's not for you. Flip over to chapter 5, 1 Samuel chapter 5, look at verse number 1 now. We're going to see a little bit about the Philistines' own form of godliness because like I said, it's not like they were right in this situation. You just got two people who were wrong. They had their own form of godliness. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So that's their god. That's their idol. So now they got this spoil of, oh, wow, we got this ark, this great ark of the, the Israel's God. It's like they've captured their god and they like put it in the house of their god, Dagon. But I love what happens here because this actually does show the power of God. And it's the power of God, not the power of that ark or that object. But God shows them that he's greater than their stupid idol. 
through this event here. Look at verse number three. It says, And when they, when they have ashed out arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Can you imagine him coming in? Their God's just, just completely just, just on his face forward before the ark. And they're like, oh man, that's kind of weird. I wonder how that happened. Someone must have, you know, must have fallen or whatever. So they go put it low. Let's just set him back up on his place because it's not, you know, if it were a real God, you think it'd be able to actually get back up on the pedestal, but it's not God. It's just an object. So they have to set it back up again. And then it says in uh, verse number four, when they arose early on the, mor on, on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So it fell down again this time, and this time it broke. It cracked, like the hands broke off, the head broke off, and all that's left is a stump of their stupid idol. But look at how superstitious they were. It says in verse number five, Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. They still think it's a god. They're like, oh, well now we can't, we can't walk on that where, where our god died. It was broken to pieces. It's not a God. But the way, you know, you could mock the Philistines and their superstition, but the children of Israel were basically being the same way with the ark. They're treating it practically the same way. These are just two stories of, of people who had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. But what I want you to do today is just apply it to yourself. What is your form of godliness? Many people have a form of godliness. And I'm not saying that you're not saved or anything. I'm just saying, you know, what, what is it that maybe is just about the looks? Some people, you know, they want to hold to the, the dress standards, right? Because, let's face it, in... in in the church, in a Baptist church, an independent fundamental Baptist church, there are certain standards that are preached. I preach these standards. I believe in the standards. I think we all ought to try to, to live up to them because we love the Lord, because we want to serve Him, because we want to follow His rules to the best of our ability, the best we can. But there's a lot of people that just hear about the standards and they, you know, they'll accept the standard, standards, but they care more about how they look in other people's eyes of looking more spiritual, kind of like the Pharisees liked wearing the long robes and loved the praise of men. They didn't care about wearing what was right in the sight of God. They cared about wearing something that was going to make themselves look better. You know what that is? That's a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We don't have these standards to just be seen of other people so that you can look or appear more spiritual. We don't say... Hey, brother, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And start using all this language that you would never normally use just to make people think, oh, wow, that guy is just must be really holy and really extra special close to God. But there are people out there that do it on purpose because they have a form of godliness. The standard should come from your heart your heart in obedience to God's word, and that's it. It's not to make a show. It's not to lift up yourself or make yourself any better than anyone else. It's just because you're trying your best to serve God in humility. That's why. That's why we have the standards. But what's your form of godliness? Is it just some tradition? Many people have a form of godliness just because they feel like they need to go to church on Sunday. Now look, we, we should go to church on Sunday. You should make it a habit. You should make it a tradition. I believe it's a good tradition to be going to church on a regular basis every Sunday. But many people, they only go to church just because it's Sunday. And they're missing the whole point. We should love to go to the church because you want to hear from God's word, because you want to encourage other people. You want to actually have a church, not just because you want to check it off of a checklist, not just because you think, well, I just have to go to church because it's Sunday and that's what my parents did and that's what I'm going to do and that's it and that's where it ends. That's a form of godliness but completely denies the power thereof. There's power in coming to church. 
you learn and grow and you sing the praises and just, just getting to know one another and helping one another, there's a lot of power there. Don't just show up just to show up. That's just a form of godliness. What about praying? Is that your form of godliness? Has prayer just turned into some chant? Has it just turned into some, another obligation? Just something that you have to do to check off a list? Oh, we're doing a prayer challenge, so I just got to check off a list that we did it and we're done. It's not the point of prayer. Again, we're not Catholics. We don't think that we just chant something over and 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 over again. And somehow that's going to make us more godly. And somehow God's just going to, on the 1,572nd time, going to be like, oh, okay, now I'm going to answer your prayer. That's not the way he operates. We don't pray through some tradition. We don't pray for some chant. We don't just recite the Lord's Prayer as he was given as an example of how to pray, not as this is what you pray every single day. When you want to pray, you just say these words. No. Prayer is communication with God. We pray because the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much because there's power to it. Because when you pray for the right reasons and you're praying to God, there's power there. It's not just a form of godliness. It's not just something that people do to be looked on as being spiritual or religious. It's something you do because there's power there. You come to church because there's power there. You, you, you live your life according to God's standards because there's power with that. It's going to give you a strong testimony because you actually believe the things that you say you believe. And you put them into practice. The Bible says in Mark eleven twenty four 24 on the prayer thing, you know, when we pray, we shouldn't just do it to check off a list. We should pray and expect to receive because we're not praying to some dumb idol that doesn't have any power. We're praying to a God that has power. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God is powerful. Because God hears our prayers. Because God will answer prayers. That's why we pray to him. We don't want to just speak into the air. And we definitely don't want to just speak in the air for the benefit of people thinking that we're real spiritual and holy. It's not the point. And if that's why you do these things, you've got a form of godliness, but you're denying the power thereof. It's a very common practice, especially in the latter days. There's a lot of false prophets that are out there trying to promote this stuff. The name it, claim it crowd. The Joel Osteen crowd. The people that just have this prosperity preaching type of crowd. That's what that is. It's all vanity. It completely denies the power. of It's all about looks. It's all about appearance. It's not about the heart. It's not about, about serving the real and one true Lord. <clears throat> Let's use these stories as an example. Now, you may think, you know what? I'm never going to come close to that. You know, I'm not going to have some graven image in my house. But just be careful that you don't make up your own God in your own mind and start twisting and warping and perverting who God really is just because of your sin or, or whatever it is that you want to make up your own God and, and do things for the right reasons. And when you're doing them for the right reasons according to the Bible, there is power to that. Father, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for your instruction, dear Lord, and for all these stories and all these examples that we have to help us to learn and, and to understand what the, the right path is and the way that we should go, dear Lord. And um, we love you. I know everyone here in this room tonight loves you and wants to serve you. And, and I believe that everyone here is sincere in their heart, dear God. I know I am. I pray that you would please... Just help us to, to grow in our wisdom and in our knowledge and that um, we, we can be a good example because we do care about your words. God, just help us to, to understand even more that we, could, that we can live more accordingly to the way you'd have us to, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.